R welcome to Brunswick First United Methodist Youth Sunday. This coming Saturday, August 4th, we have a family tubing trip to Itchituckney. <laughs> we will be leaving at 5 a.m. $20 will Twenty dollars will cover tubing costs and lunch. Everyone is welcome, families and youth. We're glad, we're glad over here and, uh, um, would y'all stand up with us? We're gonna sing our first song. It is uh, "All My Fountains." It's a new one for a lot of you, but it's just a fun celebratory song. Feel encouraged to clap your hands if you want. If you want to move around, that's that's all right. Even though it's the traditional service, excuse a little bit of the chaos. It's always a little hard getting youth service set up here. Um, just a little bit different morning, but good morning. Glad y'all are here. This is going to be good. So here we go. You ready? Yeah. <laughs> here we go. Two, three. Open the heavens. Come living water. All my fountains are in. Myself keep walking on. Here's something up ahead, a water falling like a song. An everlasting stream, your river carries me home. Let it flow, let it flow. Oh,
Thank you, Lord Jesus. And thank you, Gracie, for sharing that. That's, that's awesome. This is a this is a new hymn, and um, a lot of the church is really grabbing onto this. And I just want to encourage you to sing this this um, hymn of praise to our God right now. The chorus is real simple, and I'm going to sing it first. It goes like this. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh, oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O oh, my soul, I worship Your holy name. The sun comes up, it's a new day dawn. It's time to sing Your praise all again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing when the evening comes. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His soul. thousand reasons for my heart to find. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, my soul, my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never. time has come still my soul will sing your praise unending ten thousand years then forevermore bless the Lord oh my soul oh, oh my soul Worship His holy name. Sing like never before. Oh, my soul, I worship Your holy name. Sing bless the Lord. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul. Worship His holy. Like never before, oh my soul, I worship His holy name. Thank you, Lord. If you'd stay seat, standing um, as we affirm our faith with the Apostles' Creed, which is on, which is number eight. 81 in your hymnal. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, 
and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose, ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. It is so good to see all of you here this morning. We began at 9 o'clock over at the 9 o'clock service with the youth singing, and they have done such a, such a wonderful job. We had a great time and a good turnout at the 9 o'clock. Uh, one of the things that we need to lift up to you is that today is the last uh, day for the main event, uh, the gathering place hosting the main event over at Strickland Auditorium. So if you've never had the opportunity to see GP in action, uh, this would be a good night to go. And uh, Ben Pogue, who is on the bongos, has been playing with the uh, Gathering Place Band this summer. He's been an intern, and Jenna Hollington's been an intern. Uh, I'm sure some of the others have, have too, but uh, we're grateful for the ministry of GP in this community and pray that it will continue. Now, in connection with that, our young people have been going to Gathering Place every Sunday night since it started, beginning of the summer. And as I say, this is the end. School starts on the night. Now, Claire, where are you? I know you were in Sunday school. I didn't see you when you came in. Where's Claire Purcell? Claire, come up here, please. Claire has been uh, kind of an assistant youth person worker this summer. Every Sunday night, in order to fulfill uh, the safe sanctuary's requirement, uh, Claire has met here with the young people, gone with them over to Epworth to... Uh, um, to, like I say, to help uh, chaperone those events. And I'm not sure where that's coming from, but we're getting a little bit. Um, so anyway, we want to give Claire as a, as a token of our appreciation as a church for her being here faithfully every Sunday night to go with Shannon and to ride the bus with the young people and to go to GP and then to come home and be here until all the parents uh, picked up their youth. And so Claire, we want to give you this shirt and say thank you for your very faithful work in this church, okay? Now, just a couple other things before we, uh, before we greet one another. First of all, next week is going to be special for two very, very special reasons. Next week, John Patrick Thornton is coming home after eight months of service on the USS Abraham Lincoln. Now, next week, we're also having the Trousdales home after a couple years of service in the kingdom of God in Sarajevo. And they even had a baby, Hannah, born overseas, Jonathan and Ashley and Tyler and Hannah. And so we've got JP coming home from the service, and we've got the Trousdales coming home from service in the kingdom of God. Now, I'm kind of taking the responsibility for this. So if you want to fuss about it, you can fuss at me. Uh, did, did not really have time. In fact, it wasn't until last night I really got a chance to put all this together after getting several emails and so on. But next week, I called... Uh, uh, Susan this morning and I said can JP be here next week they're gonna pick him up at the airport next Saturday afternoon at 4 o'clock I said can he be here next week in his dress blues between 9 30 and 10 15 she said he could the Trousdales will already be here because they're going to speak at the 9 o'clock service so what I would like to do is to have a reception for all of these the Trousdales and JP Thornton in the Welcome Center uh, beginning at 9.30. Now, our service runs just a little bit longer than that for the first service, but just as soon as we're dismissed over there, we will be over to the Welcome Center. But I think two things. One, it will give you the opportunity to say thank you. Both of these, um, in the, these individuals serve in very, very special ways, all of which we acknowledge and we're thankful to God for in the life of this church. Uh, anyone who's willing to sacrifice and serve on the mission field overseas, unless you've ever done it, you don't know what that's like. What's it like to have a baby born overseas? Well, they've done it. And uh, JP has been on the carrier, the USS Abraham Lincoln, serving this country. 
and we are grateful. We're grateful to the to the Trousdales and to JP. So you come next week early and uh, meet us in the Welcome Center, and we're going to have a reception for them, okay? So meet us in the Welcome Center next week, and we'll look forward to that together. Now, uh, first-time visitors, we have gift bags for first-time visitors. I know we've got some sitting right here. Y'all hold your hand up till the ushers see it and bring you a gift bag, okay? First-time visitors to this service. We've got some back there, okay? Johnny and Stephanie Updike are here. Johnny, put your hand up back there. They've been here before, and John and Freddie. And Freddie, by the way, his Little League just won the, the Class C state championship in Little League. And Freddie's a crucial player on that team. So we want to say congratulations to him uh, from Ellaville, Sly County. And, uh, okay, first-time visitors, you see who, who they are? Let's stand and greet somebody and tell them you're glad to see them in this youth service this week. Okay, thank you, thank you for the wonderful way that you greet one another. Uh, Jimmy Langford, be sure and see me before you leave. I need to touch base with you about the Welcome Center next week, so I'm going to do that while I'm standing up here. Now, I want to introduce another visitor who I hope is going to be a regular attender of this church. Carlton Dawson is here. Y'all, Carlton has visited with us before. He is staying with us until he gets settled here. He is the new music teacher at Satilla Marsh Elementary, Nancy Purcell School. Carlton is an amazingly talented young man. Now, you've seen amazing talent up here, all of these young people, of course. But uh, Shannon is a CCLI registered artist, Christian artist, and I'm so grateful. And, and uh, Carlton is an incredibly talented young man. You'll get to hear him sing. Take the attendance registration pads. Register your attendance in this service. Let us know that you're here. If you're visitors, put down contact information so that we can be in touch with you. Now, we're going to ask the children if they will to come forward, but this Sunday, after they're dismissed from the children's sermon, we're going to ask them to stay in here so that they can participate and see the young people leading in the service, okay? So there'll be no children's church. Young children will stay in here. But all the children, if you will, come and meet uh, Miss Claudia's son, Mason, down front to do the children's sermon this morning. So all the children, come down front for the children's sermon. sit out front this morning. vacation um, from doing the children's moment but I'm being Mason's um, paraprofessional you know that person in the class that helps your teacher so I'm gonna be the paraprofessional today and Mason's gonna be the teacher I'm gonna start with um, a question for you I get to ask this question because I'm the parent ha has anybody up here ever done anything um, that maybe you thought, oh, no, I am in so much trouble with my mom and daddy. I am never going to get out of that kind of trouble. Oh, I see some. Oh, Will, no, never. I see a few people who are willing to own up to it. I think probably all of us have. Hmm? Uh-oh, yay to me, peeps. Hmm, that could be in. Okay, well, Mason is going to tell you a story about a little boy who lived in a family, and this family, for some strange reason, had a white living room. The carpet was white, 
the couch was white, and yet they had children. Doesn't make a lot of sense. And the one rule that the family had was that when you were in the white living room, you couldn't take anything in there that was colorful because what might happen? It might make something unwhite. So Mason is going to tell you a story about a little boy in that family who um, forgot, well, I'm not going to tell anymore. In the white living room, he went in and for some odd reason, he started finger painting and he spilled some finger paint on the couch cushion. And when he did, he thought, oh no, what should I do? And so he flipped the couch cushion over. Well, a little, <laughs> a little bit later, his parents found out and they asked all the children and they found out it was him. But after he came out of his room an hour later, he asked his mom, do you still love me? And she said, nothing will make me stop loving you. Just like God doesn't stop loving us. So um, Mr. Mason's message today is that no matter what we do, God doesn't hold it against us. Just like your mom and dad might be upset when something goes wrong, but they never stop loving you. God's love never ends, no matter what we do. He loves us from the beginning to the end, and it never stops. So we're going to have a prayer now. Dear Lord, Dear Lord. Thank, you for loving us. thank you for loving us, and please help us, please help us. to love others. As much as, you love us. as much as you love us. In Jesus' name, In Jesus name. Amen. amen. And go back to your parents. <laughs> but don't sit on the white couch. <laughs> Can I adjust the mic? Okay. So, one arrangement of flowers is given in loving, me in loving re memory of Marilyn Bunkley, by Richard, Susan, Brittany, and Ricky Bunkley. The second arrangement of flowers is given to wish Dwayne Scarborough a very happy birthday from Leslie, Walker, Grace, and Lila. At our local hospital, as of Thursday morning, July 26, Gilda Haythorn is in room 2489. Um, at home following a stay in the hospital, Ernie um, Kraft and Sarah Tate. Um, Sears Manor, Mary Cash, um, Scottish Rights Children Hospital, Victoria Elizabeth Hughes, and please continue to pray for Scotty Bennett, John Patrick Thornton, Brian Hayes, Edric, er, Eric Friedrich, Charles Wells, A.J. Schaefer, Lauren Manyard, and on the mission field, the Lovelace, Great House, and Charles and Trousdale families. And also um, pray for Diane Stewart. Are there any other prayer concerns? Okay. Thank you. We will now have a moment of silent prayer. Dear God, thank you for blessing everyone to be here with us today. Please let this sermon Shannon is about to preach um, touch everyone. And um, please be with everyone through the rest of the day. And let everyone have a good rest of the week. Amen. Our Father, who art, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is kingdom and power and glory forever and ever. Amen. Musicians will come back. I love how they owned it and they made all that their own. It was uh, 
really neat. There's a lot of um, beautiful um, new hymns that are out now that are like contemporary, and at the same time that they're contemporary, they're like a, 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 re, a refashioning of something familiar. And this is another one of those I want to introduce you to you. It is um, called The Song of Moses, otherwise known as Oh, the Lord, Our Strength and Song. And the chorus is um, pretty simple. It goes, praise the Lord. Oh, praise the Lord, our mighty warrior. Praise the Lord, our glorious one. By his hand, we stand in victory. By his name, we overcome. Oh, the Lord. Our strength and song, highest praise to Him belongs. Christ the Lord, conquering King, Your name we raise, Your child sing. Oh, praise the Lord, our mighty warrior. Praise the Lord, our glorious One. By his hand we stand in victory by his name we overcome the storms of helpless darkest ushers come forth to receive the offering.
on and as far as I know it's on now check you guys hear me out there yes, sir. okay great and I love it when you give the youth um, some responsibility and let them run with it uh, it's just it's really it's really cool to see them fly the thing is really that's um that really uh, I guess surprising to me and exciting at the same time is sometimes we don't realize what they're capable of and uh, and uh, teens of today, man, they can do a lot. Got a lot of talents, a lot of gifts, and, um, and uh, some big hearts, and they're willing to serve. So it's awesome. Y'all can just stay seated for the scripture because it's really long. And it's Luke 15, 1 through 32. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to hear him. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. What man of you, having, having a hundred sheep, if he lost one of them, would not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after that one that is lost until he finds it? And then when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls to gather his friends and his neighbors saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I found my sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who with no repentance. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so, I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. And he said, There was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And divided his, he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country, and there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went out, he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his field to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet, and bring the fattened calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, Your brother has come, and your father has killed the fattened calf, because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him, but he answered his father, 
Lo, these many years I have served you and disobeyed, and never disobeyed you, your command. Yet you never gave me a young goat and that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad, for this your brother was dead and is, and is alive. He was lost and is found. This is the word of God for the people of God. That's Olympic medal uh, Bible rating right there. Like distance. <laughs> the long distance race. Um, what was lost was found. I've heard it said, um, I read this uh, actually late last night, that the gospel has been described as a pool in which a toddler can wade yet an elephant can swim. And that means that, that it's simple and that as deep as you want to go, it's there. You can keep going down and down and down and down and down. And the deeper you want to dig into the gospel, the, it's the depths of God. There's unceasing. And um, that, that kind of gospel, that radical, big, deep, but simple gospel is what I want to remind all of us of this morning. Um, I'm going to paraphrase some of the story so it makes sense in modern English according to the way we kind of think about the world now and the people that we experience. So there once lived an upper class, upper middle class fiddle, business executive and he had two kids. Um, that was youngest son and you know how youngest children can be. I'm not the youngest, I'm the oldest. But sometimes younger kids can get away with a little bit more and that's the only reason I can understand how the younger son here survived, honestly. Because he basically, basically turns to his dad and says, Dad, I don't really care about you. I only care about what you can give me. Give me my share. I'm out of here. And um, if, if, if I had said that to my dad, I don't know that I would have lived. But I'm the older son. So the younger, if you're the younger sibling, then, um, then you know how that is. You get away with more. But to paraphrase, basically the heart of what he said is um, he told his father to like, okay, hurry up and die already. I just want your stuff. I'm not interested in you. And in, in, he, in Hebrew times, um, it was true, just like it is today, that you didn't get your inheritance until, you know, the person you got it from passed away. So essentially, he asked, he said, told his daddy, you're as good as dead to me, um, which is just as bad as it sounds. Um, I'll read it again. It says, there was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me my share of the property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. And um, under Jewish law, his father actually could have had him put to death. It would have been very understood. In fact, probably a lot of the people in that culture, if that had happened to a father in Jesus' day, a lot of the people in the town would have talked about him, that you, you let your kid diso dishonor you like that. He would be like a fool, looked at as a fool by the rest of the town. That is a very, very bold thing for both of them to do, a bold thing for the son and a bold, bold response from the father. Um, so... But um, with, with great sadness but grace, his father actually gave his son his share and sent him on his way. Now, as many of us know the story, but if you don't know it from the word of God, we mo a lot of us know it from personal experience. That um, uh, when you're young and foolish and you get a little bit of freedom, uh, you know, undisciplined life, total disregard for the law. In his case, he squandered his entire inheritance, ga gave it all up just in partying and wild living. And um, then the stock market crashed, and there weren't any more jobs. Well, in this case, a famine hit, a famine hit, and um, there wasn't a whole lot of options for him. And the only thing he could find to survive once the money ran out was feeding pigs. Um, I'm originally from southwestern Ohio, a little town named Georgetown that's only known for um, two reasons. Uh, General Ulysses S. Grant <laughs> lived like a few miles from me when he was alive. And, um, and a basketball player, one of my classmates, was Brian Grant, and they're totally not related. You can tell if you look at pictures of them. Um, uh, but but uh, where I lived in southwestern Ohio, um, there was a pig farm near us. And um, how, how many of y'all ever watched David Letterman back in the day? I don't know, is he still on? I don't even know. But um, I, don't, I don't watch much TV now. But when I was younger, we watched David Letterman. And um, once in the 90s, uh, he had a pig farmer on, like four or five times he had this guy on. He flew him in originally because he had a 500-pound pumpkin in his backyard that he won all these world records for. So he lo they loaded the thing up, and they took the pumpkin to the Letterman show along with the farmer. And um, he's a real, 
I, and I don't use the word necessarily mean. It's, he's, he's a nice guy, but he was a real redneck. We lived about 10 miles from Kentucky, and he was Kentucky, Ohio, not Ohio, Ohio. And so you could hardly understand what he said. And great guy, but he was really, really a pig farmer at, at heart. And, um, and uh, they had him on the show the first time because of the pumpkin, and the other three or four times Letterman just kept having him back because he was fun. You know, he never knew what to expect from the guy. Well, that guy rode my school bus growing up. Like, we were next door neighbors. So that pig farm and the big pumpkin were in our backyard, basically, about five miles away. And I lived that far out in the middle of nowhere that five miles away was neighbor. Um, and there was only, like, three or four houses between us. So we would, if you were driving towards our house from out of town and your windows were both up and you had your air on, when you hit about five to six miles away from where I lived, you would suddenly go, what is that smell? And it was the hog farm. So they, they stink. Pig farms really stink, especially when you got four or five hundred of them running around. Well, so that's one thing. Hogs are not really nice, pretty um, clean animals. But um, back in that day, and I'm trying to be as graceful about this as possible, not to gross people out, but not only were the Jewish people not allowed to um, do anything with pigs because it was against the word of God, um, what pigs were raised for back then was not bacon. They were raised because when plagues or famines overtook a, a city, they were afraid to send people in to mess with the dead bodies. And so that's what pigs were raised for, is they sent them to clean up the mess when a plague had hit. That's why you didn't mess with pigs. They were disgusting animals that were just used to clean up nasty messes that no one else wanted to deal with. They would send them into those towns. So when you think about this guy being hired on to basically care for the pigs when there's not a plague going on immediately, um, that, that's not the job you want to do. These things had lots of diseases and were around nasty things. It wasn't even that safe. And, and to a Jewish person, who this kid was raised a good Jew, he understood the Old Testament and lived with that. He, he, he would have been looked at by the rest of his culture as lowest of the low, as hardly human. He would be like the guy that ran the strip club around the corner from you or the drug dealer that stood on your corner. Um, you wouldn't look at this guy as, you probably wouldn't even talk to him if you saw him on the street. That's how low he had stooped. When you get to the point where you've fallen so low that the only job you can think of doing is something that would make you pretty much less than human to the people around you, you've hit bottom. You've hit rock bottom. And there was no further he could run from God. He could not get any more in sin and away from God's grace than he was or away from his father. So when he chose to tur turn around, he, he was as far as he could get away. But looking at the circumstances, he thought for himself, hey, my dad's slaves, and that's what the word servant actually here means, slaves. My dad's slaves have it better than me right now. Okay, the worst thing that can happen is if I turn around and talk to my dad, he could kill me. Best thing, maybe he'll take me in as one of his servants, his slaves. That's, a, that's a better than what I've got right now. So he decides to stop pig slopping and to turn around and just, he wants to grovel at his dad's feet. Please don't kill me. Please let me be one of your servants. And, um, this is what's one of the things that's wild, and, and that every, I just love about this story, that his father sees him coming at a distance. And one of the things that that tells us not, not only about, it tells us about the father heart of God, that, that God watches the horizon for his, his, his lost sheep to come back. It's not like he goes on with his life. The daddy here doesn't go on with regular life as it comes. He sees his son coming at a distance, meaning he's watching for him. Sees the horizon, he sees the dot on the horizon, and says, I wonder if that's my boy, and he starts running. That's, that's also another one of those radical things because in, in, in Jesus' time, uh, if you were a, a patriarch of your family, an, an elder, an older gentleman, he did not run. It was considered disgraceful, shameful. You were to be a fool if you ran. But this, guy, this, this awesome father who represents our hot, heavenly father, when his son disobeys him, he looks like a fool because... He doesn't squash him like a bug right then, which he could have done. He could have had them stoned. And when he comes back, instead of ignoring him, like what everyone in the culture would have told him to do, he turns, he sees him on the blip on the horizon and disgraces himself and runs to embrace the one that everyone else would say, that guy is dirty, 
that guy is disgusting. He is awful. He, does, he is living a horrible life. You shouldn't come near him. You shouldn't talk to him. You should ignore him. That's the guy that daddy turns around and runs to and embraces. So he's watching the horizon for his return. He runs to meet us when we turn to him. God, no matter how low have you, st- you have stooped, is not afraid to call you his own. And that's the first point of this sermon. Come running to your father. He's a good God and a gracious God, and he has mercy on those who turn to him, no matter where you've been, no matter how low you have gone, no matter how far you've run. But what's weird is that first part of the story is the story we actually hear most of the time when we think about the prodigal son. But most Bible scholars that have been studying it for the last at least 20 years or so have come to the conclusion that that's not really the main point of the prodigal son story. That, that that's actually them setting up the story for the main thrust of what's going on here. Um, and I'll read the rest of it again. Now his older son was in the field, and as he came, he drew near to the house, and he heard music and dancing, and he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And the servant said to him, Your brother has come, and your father has killed the fattened calf, because he has received him back safe and sound. But the older brother was angry and refused to go in. Keep that in mind. He refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him, but he answered his father, Look, these many years I have served you, and I never disobeyed your command. Yet you never gave me even a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me. All that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad, for this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. Take a wild guess who's sitting around listening to Jesus. The text tells us if we read a little bit before and after. There's a, there's a, a number of people here. Someone uh, in the first service actually said the disciples, and if you want to understand who the disciples were, you have um, a tax collector um, who basically was a white-collar criminal in that day because uh, you, it was fam- white co- tax collectors in that day were famous for skimming money off the top and pocketing it uh, when they collected their taxes. Um, You've also got fishermen who are not the smartest in the bunch. They were pretty uneducated and they just went out and fished every day. And a number of other folks that if they weren't the bad folks, they hung out with the bad folks. That's why it's amazing that the the 12 disciples that that, um, Jesus pulled together had the impact that they did. And it's one of the (laughs) reasons that you got to believe that the Holy Spirit was there and working in them. But um, so in modern English, you got corrupt folks that have money, white collar criminals, and the average bad guys. They got prostitutes and thieves. Those are the folks that Jesus always gathered around him every place he spoke because they sensed that this teacher was different than the others, that he had grace, and they would, they would come around him because they just were drawn to who Jesus was. But then there was another group of people that were there listening to Jesus. And, and the text actually tells you who they were the Sadducees and the Pharisees were, um, were, were um, actually the scribes and the Pharisees, were, um, were gathered around. And that's basically, in, in our modern English, the, the holier-than-thou, really uppity religious folks, and then the holier-than-the-holier-than-now religious folks that translated the scriptures for the holier-than-thou religious folks. So you've got, you've got these two groups of people that are kind of sitting off in the corner, listening to Jesus, and, and one of them is basically a street preacher. You know, you've got the street preachers who are just waiting to point their finger and say, you're going to, you know, and to and to condemn every word he's saying. And then you've got um, basically some seminary profs that are kind of proof texting him, checking the words that are coming out of Jesus' mouth. Is that right? Is that wrong? And, and those are the people that are also sitting around and listening to Jesus as he teaches. So here's what's wild. Those people, the good folks, or at least that thought they were good, are absolutely disgusted by the story of the first son, the first prodigal who runs away from home, That's the guy that they're always after. That's the reason they exist. That's the opposite of who they are. And that's who they're always battling against to make sure the culture of the world is not like that. And and they would have found it absolutely unbelievable that even a human daddy would have taken him back, let alone they recognize that this is a parable. And they know Jesus is telling a story to say something about God. And they would have said God would never accept that guy back. However, the second son, the older son, the good guy who's sitting at home the whole time, that's who they're cheering for. The whole time they're hearing the parable, they're connecting with him. They're like, ah, he's good. That's my guy right there. 
He's good. He's outspokenly good. He had obeyed and served his father faithfully all his life. At least he thought that in his mind. But here was the problem. The guy in the story that the, the upright, holy, religious folks connected to refused to go to the feast. Every Jewish people in Jesus' day knew what the feast meant. Anytime anyone ever talked about the feast uh, in, in a parable, they're talking about heaven. They're talking about the afterlife. So their guys, the good religious fellows who behaved themselves, who served faithfully, he refused to enter if the pig slopping younger son was going to be there. He'd write, he's, he basically said, if, if that guy's going to be in heaven, I don't want to go. The people who thought that they were good enough to, were not getting in, is what Jesus was saying. The folks that thought they could do it on their own, that they could be upright enough, that they could be holy enough, that they could keep the law good enough, were basically being told that, look, look, that you're, you're not the guys that are getting in. You're not going to the feast. You're not going to the party. The son who knew he was lost turned to his father for forgiveness and was received with open arms. But the son who thought that he was good, believing his father owed him one, he refused to come to the party. And that's the second point to the sermon and the key truth of this passage. Two, don't refuse to go to the party. At times in our lives, we'll all find that we're on one side or the other. I flip-flop back and forth and have caught myself at times where um, I realize that I'm being the older son. And then I can point to times in my life where I was more like the younger son, where I was running the opposite way, direction from God. Here's kind of, kind of some, some ways of represent, uh, uh, recognizing the older son in us. When life doesn't go as you've planned, does your heart automatically turn to bitterness? Like, God, I deserve better than this. Look at all I've done for you. That's the, that's the bad thing right there. You hear that come out of your mouth. Look at all I've done for you. You know right now, you're, you're actually standing right there in the position of the second son, the older son, who thinks that God owes him one. Are you angered when others get away with sin, or are you secretly jealous, even though you can't do the same and get away with it? Are you offended by grace and want to see others, definitely not yourself, but other people, get what's coming to them or sleep in the bed they've made? That's definitely the older son. Let this gauge your heart. Both brothers are prodigals. Both brothers are prodigals. Both of their hearts were far from the father. Both ran from daddy's love and both broke his heart and both need forgiveness by the end of the parable. Or the younger brother, your life's a mess. Your heart knows that, you know, God doesn't owe me anything. But you can simply turn to him, arms wide open. If you're the younger son, and you're still far away from home, turn around. And that's what the word repent means. That's all it means, is turn around, and you'll find God running to you, full of grace and mercy. There's an author I really like named Tim Keller. He's a pastor from New York City and has had a big impact up there. And he's done well in pointing out that man-made religion says if you obey, you'll be accepted. If you do this, 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 and this, you'll, you'll be accepted. And that's how you know when something's human and not, not, not from God is when you see this list of if you do these things, you're, you're getting heaven. That's the view of both sons. Reread the parable. Both sons believe that. The only difference is, is that one decided he's going to stick it out and keep serving and serving and serving and serving and thinks his daddy owes him something. And the other son's like, hey, it's not worth it. Give me my junk. Die. I don't want a relationship with you. I'm out of here. But their hearts are still the same. They both think they can earn acceptance. They both think they deserve something because of what they do. <clears throat> but the gospel, the heart of the gospel is this. You are absolutely accepted, and you can be confident that you're accepted. And then when we confidently stand in the Father's love and acceptance, only then can we obey in response to that. And instead of trying to earn from God his favor, we recognize we have his favor in response. We're going, thank you, Jesus. What can I do for you just to thank you? And those are totally different things. And that second one comes out of the gospel. So when we wrestle against our own inner prodigals, this is my third point. Number three, we live out the radical grace of God. And we live out the radical grace of God like this. That's to say, if you tend to be like the older son, don't strive to earn God's love anymore. Just rest in God's love for you. It's like one of those mind-blowing things, like rest. How do I rest in God's love for me? 
Or if you're the younger son, you don't buckle under the misconception that your father's love can be earned. Musicians, can you come on up here? So this is what we do. We daily choose to live our lives in response to the love of a loving daddy who accepts us wholly as his own. So what the position of our hearts needs to be, we just turn and run to him as he runs to us. And um, as we leave here this morning, I want to share this last song really as an extension of this sermon. Um, This is a song that I wrote a number of years back and um, had essentially forgot about and uh, have just lost up here. Do you have another copy of that somewhere back there? You can hand it to me. Thank you, sweetie, my beautiful wife. Um, Appreciate that. This is essentially our hymn of commitment. If you don't stand, sing this with us as soon as you grab a hold to it. The chorus, we'll start with the chorus, and it goes like this. It goes, you came running when I turned to you. You were calling me before I ever knew I was lost.
Our Heavenly Father, uh, please watch over us as we go about this week. Uh, protect us in what we do. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. keep singing. This is, uh, this is our walk oh, There you go. Separate me from your mighty hand. 